All right, uh, let's get it started. All right, today uh, today's webinar is front end performance with Gatsby. Um, my name is Dan Giordano. I run product marketing for Gatsby, and with me uh, today for our technical side is uh, Grayson Hicks, who runs our uh, really like our customer concierge engineering program here, um, and deals with tons of concierge customers that are coming to look for us uh, for front end performance uh, help. So today we'll have a great in-depth look kind of at what that entails and, and maybe what that program leads to as well. All right, I skipped the housewarming slide. Um, don't have one, but let's do housewarming first. This will definitely be recorded. Um, so we are going to send this out in probably 48 hours after this, once we get it all processed and captioned out. Um, so if you do need to leave, uh, don't fear, we'll get this to you. But if you do stay, we're gonna do some live Q&A um, and feel free to ask questions during this. Um, and on that question note, uh, last piece of the housekeeping, please put questions in the Q&A. Uh, there's two parts of Zoom webinar. There's the chat and then there's Q&A. Uh, the chat gets real hard to uh, organize. So if you do have a question, put it in the Q&A spot um, and we'll try and get to it during uh, this session. If, uh, if it pertains and we can get to it during, We'll stop kind of and, and walk through the question um, during the webinar. If not, we'll uh, get to it at the end. All right, so first off, uh, let's look at what we're gonna be doing today. Uh, we're gonna be looking at what performance affects, right? What part of our business it affects, uh, why we care about it. Um, then we'll walk a little bit about diagnosing and how we measure performance uh, on the web today. Uh, and then we'll kind of round that out with how Gatsby sees the world of performance and what Gatsby is doing behind the box and kind of out of the box um, to help with performance um, for any type of website. All right, so let's get through it. Um, what does performance affect? Uh, it affects your entire digital experience. Um, starting with the user experience, and that is really the broadest uh, piece. It's more of like your branding piece, but everything needs to uh, look right, feel right, uh, be responsive. That trickles into sales and revenue and conversion. Um, we see it, tons of data come out um, by Google, by shopping vendors, Shopify, doing tons of research on speed. Um, anything over three seconds is really gonna start to really curb your conversion um, percentages. Anything over five seconds of load time is actually really gonna stop that sale from happening. So we really wanna focus on speed around that conversion, sales and revenue. It's kind of that uh, top line that we're driving there. And then rounding that out is visitor traffic, which we'll talk about a lot with kind of Google. And this, this talk really isn't meant to be uh, like a core Web Vitals uh, webinar, but we'll definitely go through a lot of that. And we'll go through a lot of how Google is scoring um, websites today uh, and how that affects their organic traffic. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how we can judge performance and what tools we have today to do that. One way is to measure core web vitals, and it's not every single uh, thing we can do. There's a lot of different tools out there. Um, we're gonna go through a lot of Google specific tools today. Um, there are some other ones that maybe we'll talk to um, at the end, but core web vitals is kind of the summation of everything Google is doing in the world of tracking performance. So there's a lot of, let's say web vitals, and they're important things to rank your website, uh, things like making sure that you're running over H HTTPS, uh, safe browsing mode, make mobile friendly. We're doing breakpoints and Google's figuring that out. And that's just kind of a checkbox, right? You're either mobile friendly in Google's eyes and you're uh, indexed in their mobile friendly um, kind of catalog and, and uh, served up on a mobile device or kind of you're not. Core web vitals are this great measurement that sits atop this that really measures the experience of the end user. And it goes through a couple of different ways, but it is a subset that Google is certainly emphasizing. It's starting to roll out in 2022. It got delayed a lot in 2021. We saw it at the end of the year. Um, and it's really going to be kind of uh, the, fo the ongoing focus of Google, but also something that's fluid, right? Where I think there's going to be actually new parts of web vital, core web vitals that come out maybe in 2022, 2023, that are even more advanced, that aren't just strictly based off uh, some like small stats. Uh, but again, these are the three that we're focusing on today. Largest contentful paint, first input delay, and cumulative layout shift. 
These are ranking on a kind of a three-tier basis from good, needs improving to poor. And you'll notice this in a lot of different reports um, from a lot of different vendors, but these three are what we'll see today. LCP, FID, and CLS. So we'll quickly kind of go through what each means here, um, and then we can get through measuring them. Um, so largest contentful paint is, are your largest and most taxing resources, whether that's images, videos, JavaScript, um, HTML, what is the longest that gets to get painted? This is something that I think really was um, big for Google because obviously any score that's uh, really kind of tracked uh, in a linear way is easy to game. Uh, things like time to first bite and time to first paint in the beginning, you could game a lot of that uh, with a lot of like different things you did on how you loaded content. With largest contentful paint, it's just kind of a more expansive look at in general. Um, how the user sees that website. We'll see here an image of something uh, blurry in the beginning. Actually, this is Boston. It's kind of right around the corner from me. Uh, and then on the bottom, you'll see it totally loaded. So this is an example of that large contentful paint uh, would render when that last image is there. First input to put display or delay, sorry, FID. Um, when is the user finally allowed to click something? So this happens a lot um, with websites to load the HTML, load a lot of the CSS and make it look normal. Um, but maybe there's JavaScript not totally uh, loaded on the site. And that prevents you from maybe clicking a button that's uh, more like with a button tag and not like a straight link. Um, there's small things that can be rendered in the browser um, that just aren't clickable um, until your uh, that last like maybe third party snippet is loaded. Um, that all is part of the first input delay. Um, I think on a mobile device as well, you see it a lot. Um, but it's something that, again, from a user perspective or user experience perspective, uh, it can be annoying. It can also feel like, again, just because it's there and the images are loaded, which was maybe easy to game for the developer, uh, I still can't use the site. So it's really on that usability portion. And then lastly is the cumulative layout shift. This one's my favorite one because it's probably the most visible and easy, annoying one uh, to show uh, any customer. Are there any unexpected large shifts in the layout of the website coming while the website is being loaded? So let's say the first two seconds, um, you get the title of an article and you get the body of an article and you're reading it and you're about to click maybe a link. And then all of a sudden an ad pops up, right? Cause that ad didn't, they didn't want to load the ad in the beginning cause it would have slowed down the whole website but it's still gonna get loaded in there at the end. Um, and it's really gonna mess up the entire browser experience. You'll see like in this GIF, I think is a super easy example of uh, me every day browsing uh, a website that is showing me some news or sports data um, that is loading in some annoying ad uh, at the end. So this is cumulative uh, layout shift. This is another really important one that again, you can see that Google's digging deeper than just surface level uh, like browser analytics and actually thinking about how this would affect uh, the user. All right, so Grayson's going to walk us through a little bit about how all those things are measured and what we can do kind of in a diagnostic way uh, to look through them. I'll start you here if you'd like, Grayson, and then just let yeah, me know. When sounds I good. Hey, everybody, I'm Grayson. I actually, I see some names I recognize in the chat. So um, hello to everyone that I, that I have met and to those that I have not. Um, but yeah, when it comes to these performance tools, I mean, it's, it's really hard to know like what is actually being reflected by some of these tools and what they're measuring. So it's, it's really important to kind of cut through and say, okay, when should I use each tool and what is it actually trying to tell me? So one of the first things you want to look at is, is lab data versus field data, right? So uh, lab data, like it says, synthetic measurement of performance, that's typically like, okay, I'm going to use a bot and run the bot against the URL and what is the bot's um, experience, right? So there is a lot of factors that could go into that. Depending on the provider, you probably don't know what actual machine they're using uh, to run it. Uh, you don't know what kind of network connection they're using. Um, Google, for example, we don't know what they're using. They don't publicize it, but then they use an algorithm to like work backwards and pretend that it was on a certain mobile device on a certain connection, which is not always accurate. But that doesn't mean it's totally useless. It's just, you know, keep all that in mind. Field data is going to be what did actual users um, experience on your site. So, um, for example, you may be a you may have a a service that is almost entirely done on mobile, 
right? Um, so you're going to want to make sure that your, your site is very performant for people on mobile. On the other hand, you could have something that's basically a desktop app that nobody uses on mobile, right? And your, your clientele may have really high powered devices and really good network connections. And so your, your field data may look great, right? Your lab data may, may not look great, but at the end of the day, your users are being served well, right? And so we'll see, we'll see a report um, here, but, but that's the difference. Field data is typically gathered when people opt in to certain data sharing with, with Chrome or, or other browsers and they, they say, yes, you can collect my data. One of the things they collect is performance metrics. So that means it's, it's the most accurate um, data that you can get for people's experience on your site. Cool, Lighthouse. I mean, you gotta start with this one. It's, uh, I mean, it's almost synonymous with the idea of performance measuring when people say, well, what's your Lighthouse score, right? They, they really mean like, you know, what's the performance of your, of your site. Um, but Lighthouse is gonna be run typically by you in your browser. Um, if you don't set any of the settings, it's going to use like your, mach your machine, your network connection, like your CPU, your internet, um, to get the score, right? So if we, again, going back to field data, if you are like um, representative of your average user, then that's fine. You'll know like what your average user is experiencing on a certain page. But if you're not, then there's some settings you'd have to tweak of, uh, you can throttle your network, you can reduce the number of CPU cores that your computer uses for the test. Um, but this is easily the most common one. It's, it's um, it's not bad by any means, but it's, it's typically used as a snapshot, right? Like it's, it's a moment in time, very particular um, um, set of settings uh, for getting this. That being said, it comes with a great report, right? So uh, when you scroll down these reports, it'll say, hey, here's what's, here's what's wrong, essentially, right? Like uh, these images can be WebP, you know, this uh, third party JavaScript is costing you this much time. Right, so there's there's lots of insights that can be gained from this, um, but sometimes the numbers themselves um, they're very very dependent on where the test is being run. Let's put it that way. But the report super valuable. Yeah, this one's running incognito. I would always recommend that just because it takes a lot of the browser you're in with a lot of the plugins. Like if you use a lot of Chrome extensions and yep. you take them all out, you're going to get a vastly weirdly different score, which can always be annoying. All right, next up, we got page in, page speed insights. Cool. So page speed insights. This is essentially lighthouse, but like taken off of your everything I just said about your machine, your connection, take that part out of the equation, and then it runs on Google's machine, Google's connection. Now again, they don't publicize what kind of machine they're running that on and what kind of connection. Um, from from the research I've done and the conversations I've been a part of with people that have been on the Lighthouse team and and some open source threads around Lighthouse, it's it's generally assumed this is a very high powered server on a very fast connection, like in a Google server farm. Um, that then they, again they use an algorithm to to go backwards and they say, okay, on the typical desktop connection, it, it would have actually been this. On a typical mobile connection, it would have been this. Um, so. Again, their algorithms are pretty solid. I mean, they're Google. That's that's what they're known for. Um, but keep in mind, it is it is synthetic. It's not anyone's actual experience. And and a good example of that is in in one of these threads, a developer had a set timeout on their site where it literally could not load before two seconds, right? Yet the like first contentful paint and stuff from Lighthouse was like around one second, definitely under two seconds, which is was literally impossible. And it just illustrated that it wasn't actually experiencing the site, right? It was getting some initial numbers and then running them through a formula to try to guess what the numbers were, right? So a little bit of a contrived example, but it does illustrate the point that like there's, there's some uh, caveats involved with this. Um, again, that being said, I really like this report because this is the, the quickest way to see your, your field data, right? So when you run this report, you will see field data and lab data. So the lab data is going to be what the server uh, got, uh, what it, the numbers that it got on its run. Uh, the one above it is the field data, which is going to be the 28 day average of your user's experience. So that's like the, that's like the gold standard of, of how your site's being experienced by your users. Um, there are other ways to see the field data, which we'll see in a second, but this is the quickest way uh, to see it. Now the field data is lagging, right? So if you pushed a, 
PR, you're like, oh, this is our performance improvement PR. We pushed it yesterday and you run page speed insights. You might see something in the lab data, but you will not see an impact yet in the field data, right? Because it's a, it's a 28 day lag before they release that and update that data. Cool. So the crux report, this is almost like synonymous with, uh, with field data to me. Um, but it's the, it's, it's Chrome's specific version of it. Uh, field data could be a little more generic. There could be other tools that are gathering field data, but crux is like the Google flavored, um, version of field data. So this is people that have opted into data sharing with Chrome. Um, it logs their experience. Um, and then you can see that in your, in your Google analytics. Um, it's, it's great. It, it will show the percentage of users that are having a bad time, the percentage of users having a good time and, and, and the people that are in between. Um, and, and again, that's, that's for certain metrics. This is the most important one, but again, it typically is like a very slow iter iterative process, right? Because as you release stuff, it takes a long time to get, to get a glimpse of it. That being said, there is a Gatsby plugin. Um, I think it's with Gatsby cloud that, uh, basically will capture these core web vitals for you and you can send them to like your own Google Analytics report and see them very, very quickly. Um, you can see your users uh, actual experience before that 28 day window, but in general, it's still considered um, a, a lagging indicator. And Search Console, I really like this one. Um, Search Console, instead of just showing um, your the, the core web vitals, it looks at your site as like a subset of pages. So it'll say, okay, um, like for this example, you can see by the end about half of the URLs for a domain are in, are in the green, you know, about a third or something are, ye are yellow and then the rest are red. But so this kind of tells you um, how much of your site is performing well. So this can be useful because uh, you can have certain pages that are like money, money makers, like money drivers, and then some that aren't but it lets you get an idea of uh, which groups of pages. Um, and in a Gatsby context, you can even track it down to the template. It's like, oh, everything at slash, um, you know, slash blog is in, is in the yellow. Like, let's, we know exactly what's, which template to target um, to, address, uh, to address any performance problems there. And this also shows trends as well. So you can have, if you do merge, like if you see a problem, if you see a sudden spike one way or another, you can go back and say what PRs got merged, what happened. Um, um, you can see if something impacted pages that you weren't expecting, things like that. Um, we have a few, we have two questions on actually just a quick topic. Uh, I was gonna bring up before and I'm joking better about uh, surveillance, but uh, how is the field data collected? Uh, the field data collected on most of Google's products is probably honestly through some third party things, but also like just Chrome and Android and their mobile browsers and Chrome on a iPhone. All that is taking anonymous data in the background and sending it back to Google. And that is basically how they're calculating that field data because of that. And also the anonymization factor. Um, if you have like a small site with not a ton of traffic, they're not going to give you field data um, in that respect. It's a little bit probably too close and you can fingerprint it, um, but you do have to have like a minimal amount of uh, traffic over a 30 day period to get that field data from them. Yep. Yep. It's basically, basically you check the box at some point when you installed Chrome <laughs> and said, yes, you can see my data, uh, but yeah, they <laughs> won't do it. My... If it's, they won't do it if it's too small because people have ways of possibly figuring out like who a certain visitor was, you know, uh, so they don't, you have to have a certain number of visits. All right. Uh, last tool here is the old yeah. one. Yeah. So dev tools. Um, honestly, I feel like if I'm in dev tools, uh, I've solved a lot of my other problems with performance, right? Dev tools means I'm typically debugging total blocking time, uh, maybe timed interactive, um, looking at waterfall, uh, you know, network requests, things like that. Um, yeah, so dev tools, I mean, there are people that are pros just to dev tools. You can get very, very deep into profiling and, and things like that, but it lets you find uh, specific scripts, sometimes down to specific functions that are, that are causing problems, that are blocking. Um, and blocking in this context means, you know, the browser only has so much, well, I don't say bandwidth, but, you know, if you imagine, yeah, I guess you say bandwidth is like a pipe. 
right? And the, the browser can only execute and uh, handle so much JavaScript at once. So um, what happens is if, if one script or function is taking a long time, then nothing else is able to, to be executed. And certain times of the page load are busier than others. So some strategies are, you know, changing the point in time when a certain script is running. Um, most often you talk about deferring the script and not really moving the script forward. Most of the time it's say, hey, let's defer it. And a lot of times you do that because um, the browser becomes less busy, right? So it's not that uh, the, the JavaScript actually runs any faster uh, on its own, like in isolation, the browser is always going to run that JavaScript at the same speed. But when it's also trying to do other things, um, it runs it runs slower. So typically, what you have is is deferment. Um, and so, yeah, Dev Tools is normally where I'll do that. I also like the screenshot tool in Dev Tools, like the screenshot timeline, to let me see sometimes like a a flash of uh, like a re-render, like a really obvious re-render. Um, or for FCP, you know, it puts the flags in there for the the, the timings. A timings option there you'll see that uh, you can see in green there like first paint first contentful paint right lets me kind of identify when certain things are happening possibly identify a script that might be affecting that but dev tools you're normally doing a bit of a deep dive but uh but very useful all right uh next up oh, we got how does gatsby affect performance so let's talk a little bit about like the things that come out of the box with gatsby and, and how they affect um, low times, page speeds in general. Um, I, yeah, the first one is kind of our bread and butter, uh, static rendering. It's the default mode of Gatsby. Um, it is kind of what uh, was our specialty. Um, and we'll talk about actually rendering modes at, next. Um, we'll talk about DSG and SSR, but in general, static rendering is always gonna be the most performant. Um, as we, it minimizes everything and does everything at build time. So if you can think about from a tax perspective or, or like who's going to get kind of, uh, the, the short end and stick on the experience, uh, it can either happen at build time. So everything can be done all that build time before, uh, anything gets out. Uh, for us, we have things like incremental uh, builds to speed that up, but that's all going to take place on kind of the developer side. So everything is going to be, uh, taxing the dev. Static rendering is great uh, and is the superior method for the user experience because of all that tax that was done at build time, almost nothing gets done uh, at runtime. Everything is already there. If you can think about like a native app experience or like, let's say a, uh, I don't know. Yeah, native app experience that has everything downloaded. Uh, when you click a link or you click a new page and let's say your Kindle book, it happens instantly because the app is aware of all the data and all the information that you are going to do next. Um, with normal websites with server-side rendering, uh, that's nearly impossible because every single time you go to ask for something, uh, it makes a trip back to the server and makes sure that it has the latest data. With static rendering, it all gets done um, on the client side once that first load has happened. Um, so it's why when you click a link on a Gatsby site, it seems like it's almost like intelligent and already there. Um, it's because it's already done at build time. Um, and we do things like prefetching, uh, prefetching, code splitting. Um, these are all things that happen um, because of the static rendering uh, that occurs during build time. Prefetching uh, and Gatsby link is actually uh, a kind of a good example of they go hand in hand, but prefetching, we're going to basically intelligently load all the resources, all the assets you need um, in an almost just-in-time manner. Um, so let's say, and I don't know if we're going to do this on the, uh, our example today, but let's say page uh, loads and it has 10 links. And then uh, each of those 10 pages has a unique set of another 10 links. Um, when that visitor is on that first page, because those links are present, Gatsby will go start downloading silently in the background all of the resources that are needed on those 10 pages. Um, just from knowing that you could go there next, uh, that's like, again, one of the cool ways that we're thinking about how a user browses a, uh, a website and what we can do to make it faster. Um, things like inline critical CSS, uh, it's messy um, semantically, it, it, it's tough from the browser, but it is the best way to uh, performantly load um, a web page is making sure that not everything needs to be inline, um, but any critical CSS that 
uh, is going to make, again, your layout shift a ton. Um, it's better to have it in line and closer um, to that browser going through and rendering. And then lastly, uh, on this page here is Gatsby image. Um, and that's just the process of us, again, optimizing and pre-processing any image uh, media heavy website might have at build time. Instead of doing it at runtime, um, all of that is being done upfront. Um, and it comes uh, with Gatsby plugin image uh, right out uh, of the gate with Gatsby. Um, Grayson, do you have anything else like on this? I know there's like tons of features. This was kind of supposed to be a feature thing. Um, so if you're not using one of these uh, as a listener, uh, make sure uh, to, to be on the lookout and use some. Yeah, I mean, each of these could be a uh, like a conference talk in and of themselves. Um, but yeah, all, all together that that makes up the bulk of like the, the tools that Gatsby that Gatsby offers. All right, let's talk about render real quick um, to round the slides out. Render pages um, is a, basically a way that the, the user and the, the website are gonna interact over time with data. So you either render static site generation. Um, what we have is new, it's called deferred static rendering. And then the deferred static generation, you got confused there, server-side rendering. Um, I can fix that quick. Uh, but static site generation, again, that's the default. It's going to be the most performant. Um, the problem is, is a lot of times with large websites, um, a full cold build um, can take a bit of time, again, because we're pre-processing all of that in the front load or in the front of the uh, like pipeline of supplying new content to your end user. With incremental builds in Gatsby Cloud, we can speed that up by like 10x by just worrying about changes that were made, not worrying about rebuilding the entire site. Um, but there's still things that incremental build um, on the fly where we need to do some other things to make uh, working with data more flexible. Um, so we've introduced with Gatsby for these two new rendering modes. We have first deferred static render or generation and then server side rendering. So if server side rendering on the opposite of static side generation is when every single page uh, that's requested um, is going to take a round trip to the server and get the latest data. So if you have an update um, and you push it on like, let's say a CMS the server side, that server uh, is going to get asked for that new data and it's going to be instantly loaded in the browser. So um, every time someone asks for, let's say a new page with a new score, and that needs to be updated per second, server-side rendering um, is gonna be a real great um, use case here. It's going to be more flexible with how you get that data and how quickly you get that data. But there are performance hits on the server-side rendering piece, right? When you do server-side rendering, you're making that round trip over and over, um, and you're gonna take the performance hit uh, on your website. So you can think about large e-commerce sites um, that you go to, for each item you click, um, it's gonna take like that two to three second load time, right? And where the website kind of goes away uh, and it comes back and everything gets rebuilt over and over. That's like a good example of kind of the web for the last 20 years. Um, and that's really server-side rendering that, that lack. In the middle is what we have is called deferred static generation. And that is a new method um, of rendering your uh, pages on a kind of hybrid manner but also in a way that gives the best experience the most amount of visitors you have. So with deferred static generation, you're gonna give us a list of critical pages. So the pages that need to be in that upfront build that need to be rendered um, in SSG at current build time, you're gonna give us those lists and we're gonna go through those first. That build is gonna finish. And then we're gonna build in the background any pages that are requested that weren't in your critical list. So let's say you have a marketing site with 20 pages, and then there's another thousand pages of blog material that you've been tracking over the last 10 years. Um, those last, let's say 4,000 pages or 500 pages, they don't get read that often because they're from 10 years ago. Those are great candidates for deferring. So all the other pages are gonna get built up front at build time statically in the most performant way possible. And then those last pages are gonna be deferred. So when that first user um, clicks a page, they're gonna get that info um, in let's say a server-side rendering kind of uh, methodology. So it's gonna take about, let's say 1.5 seconds. After that first user uh, requests that page, it's then gonna be statically placed on the edge and everybody else is gonna get it completely statically after. 
Um, so in that way, we're really trying to give this flexible middle ground for worrying about static site while also not making build time um, kind of a crutch that you can't pass um, with static. So just to like further walk through some, I think like examples and, and uh, graphics. On the right here, you can see that first request. Um, it's going to go completely through uh, the cache because again, this is server side rendering. It's gonna ask the server for the latest information. So it's skipping the edge, going to the server, grabbing that latest information and making a full round trip back to the uh, user. On the second request, it's doing the same thing because again, server side rendering, you're, at, you're telling the server that you want the latest information no matter what their performance hit is each time a user asks for it. You'll see with deferred static generation, only that first user takes that hit. So the first user grabs that information from the server after that, it's placed up on Google Gatsby Cloud hosting here um, on the edge. And that second request is gonna be completely statically uh, delivered and it's gonna be uh, wildly performant. So this is kind of that in-between that we've come out with between static site generation and then server-side rendering. Um, I know Grayson, you've been working with clients. Deferred static generation is, I think, a really unique way to, to scale right, SSG to the largest clients in the world. Yeah, it, it really is kind of like, uh, it's not something that I'd recommend for smaller sites, right, that aren't having like real scale issues. Um, it's, meant for, it's meant for the larger sites. Um, you can identify a piece of, you know, some logic around a type of content like blogs and say, all right, all blogs more than five years old, you know, are getting deferred. Even better, you can, you know, hook into Google Analytics and be like all blogs, you know, with from the bottom half of views, or if you haven't been viewed in three months or whatever, um, let's, let's defer it. Exactly. And we have tons of questions, um, which is awesome. Uh, I'm just looking through them here. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, if you want to kick up the starter and like load up the kind of and go through prefetching and some links, I can start asking some questions, Grayson. If not, it's no big deal. We can, uh, I think you're muted. Not muted. You're muted. Sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, I feel like we have enough questions. So, like, let's, yeah, let's get it. through these questions. Um, I, I definitely saw a couple that were in the chat that weren't in the Q and A that seemed like they would be good to answer, but maybe we can just go in order. Um, Anonymous asks about um, create pages versus on create page. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, they asked about. Uh, React Lazy Hydration. So they got a speed boost by lazily hydrating all the components below the fold. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty common. Um, yeah, I mean, we do have Gatsby plugin loadable components SSR. What that does is it maintains SSR. So um, you may not want to do that in some cases, though. It, it really depends. In some cases, you actually want to lazy load stuff that's below the fold. Um, and you want the above the fold stuff to still be SSR. Um, it says it breaks anchor links from other sites. Uh, I guess maybe if it's pointed to like a, uh, to an ID on a div, it could break. Yeah, I guess in that case, you would need to maintain SSR on those. I'm, I'm not sure, but yeah, uh, lazy loading and below the fold is, is a great tool to use. Um, in terms of core web vitals, how are websites with preloader screens rated? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by preloader screens, but if it's just like a loader, like a spinner, I would say that that, that hurts. Um, it depends on how it's done though. You could actually have the markup behind like some kind of absolute div, right? That's where as long as the markup is, is still there, then, then it's good for SEO, um, but I, I'm not sure exactly how it handles, you know, full screen. Yeah, and even swapping, like a lot of it, I probably wouldn't do that where if you're like swapping the image and then loading some HTML behind it, I probably. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would definitely be careful with that. Um, how do we embed YouTube videos onto the site without having the performance impacted? Well, this is a great question to like, go ahead and get out there. There are things that if you want to do them at some point, you're going to have to just agree to accept the performance costs, 
right? And and that's okay, right? There's another question I saw um, that'll have the same kind of answer, but like, if you want to load a big video, sometimes there's no way around it, right? There are things that you can do um, depending on where the video is located on the page. You know, if it's above the fold, um, you can actually like prioritize the YouTube script, like make it load faster. Um, if it's below the fold, you can defer stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, it, for certain things that maybe make your business money, um, you might have to pay a performance cost in order to generate that, that revenue. And there's not always like a, a magic um a magic bullet to get, to get rid of stuff so it kind of it kind of depends on on how you're doing the youtube videos um yeah it comes up a lot with the tracking stuff i think there was a couple questions about yeah uh, google tag manager google analytics um especially with the new one at some point like you can track nothing uh and have the fastest website but if you need to track things to tell google you're converting or tell ads that they're working like you're, okay, your business isn't going to make as much money. Um, and the point of the speed on the website is to make your business more money, uh, give it users a better experience. So there's definitely kind of that middle ground that you'll have to stake at some point. Yeah, I see a lot of people pointing out the light YouTube embed from Paul Irish, you know, who's uh, part of the Lighthouse team at some point, I think. So that's a great one. It's, it's kind of a non-Gatsby thing at the end of the day. Like there's lots of YouTube, um, there's lots of articles about about the YouTube library in particular. Um, it says, I use on from Justin, I use on create page and create pages. The bulk of the website is with on create page. Does that rendering uh, impact crawling indexing? No, I mean, however, if a page is created by Gatsby with, with SSG, then it's treated the same. Um, as Dan mentioned, like we do have DSG and SSR now, but if you're using on create page or create pages, um, I'd probably be curious why you're doing on create page. I, I typically recommend create pages. Um, we tend to have more optimizations for build speed and stuff and caching through create page, um, but I'm not sure exactly what your use case is. But as far as the page that, that results from that, either one, it's just static HTML. So there's no, there's no impact. There's uh, a follow-up question where he clarifies uh, why he uses on create page. Yeah, I would, is it preferred I use create pages? I would say yes um, in, in general. Um, I don't know why. I don't know what the situation that would force you to use on create page, but um, what do you think about Gatsby image, Gatsby link affecting page performance above the fold? Um, it should help above the fold. Um, I think I see another question from Cesar. So we'll come back to that, but it should help above the fold. Um, Gatsby link. I mean, I guess if you have a ton of Gatsby links above the fold, um, it will start prefetching them, but um, if you're not hovering it, then it's a low priority network requests to preload it's so it's gonna happen in the background anyway yeah so it shouldn't it shouldn't be affecting um the the page speed um best way to do inline critical css gatsby does that for you uh, i've never had to uh in, in all my auditing and such had to touch anything with uh inline and critical css outside of what gatsby does by default um i'd, I'd just recommend use a use like css modules style components like one of the one of the big ways of doing CSS and you should be fine. How does using a third-party image host such as Cloudinary impact Gatsby image uh, performance? Um, I guess it's going to be a request to not where your website is hosted. So maybe a slight penalty versus the assets being hosted on the same domain as, uh, as the rest of the site. But it, for people use Cloudinary in different ways. So everything, all my answers here have like a caveat because there's so many ways to use different tools, but um, yeah, Cloudinary is normally used as like a built uh, to, to alleviate build time problems where you're generating a lot of images, um, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't have a big impact. And again, it's one of those things that the benefit is your site builds a lot faster. So it's, to, it's totally worth it um, in your case, but I would, I typically just, I recommend side-by-side -side tests for like so many things. People are like, oh, what about this third-party script? What about this or that? Make a branch, do what you want to do, and then use a tool like web page test, or as long as you're consistent with your testing, like test the two pages and, and compare, right? At the end of the day, that's that's the only way that you can tell um, is to test it out. So Cesar followed up with his Gatsby image above the fold question and said, I've had to change placeholder from blurred to traced 
than to none to cut down on page data JSON. So yeah, every, every placeholder does have like slightly different behavior. Um, what I recommend for above the fold Gatsby images is to set the uh, loading equals eager, right? So, so often we talk about loading equals lazy and, and defer and lazy and do it later, right? But um, there is an option that's a browser option. It's not, it's not a Gatsby option, but on an image tag with uh, loading equals lazy, there's also loading equals eager. And that, that bumps the image up in priority. So if you know an image or a component is always above the fold, um, then you can set loading equals eager and it'll actually improve the performance, which is kind of counterintuitive to what we've, we've all kind of heard the last couple of years. But uh, so heroes, I'll even do a test sometimes in the code if it's a loop, right? And I know that like the first three of a grid are likely to be above the fold. You know, it's like, all right, if the index is, you know, less than or equal to two, then loading equals eager, everything else in the grid loading equals lazy, right? For those images. So um, for Gatsby images that are above the fold, do loading equals eager. Um, is there an option in Gatsby to apply route-based splitting to CSS? Um, yeah, I have, I have to think about that. I think it does some of that by default. I think it's often just kind of rare that, um, or you know what? I think there's an option, uh, like a, a Webpack option. Uh, I'll, I'll have to find it, but it's, uh, yes. Uh, the, the answer is yes. I just can't remember if it happens by default or if you have to change, um, change an option. Um, this is a great question. I'm excited about this one. Um, how can I optimize my site when business requires a ton of third-party scripts be ran, mainly ads and analytics? Um, I tried request idle callback, but that causes the site to be non-responsive right after it becomes responsive. So I'm going to post a link in the chat for uh, reducing your JavaScript bundle cost. You may have come across this before already, but specifically for this question, it mentions a couple Gatsby lifecycle hooks of where to put in um, the scripts. So basically you can defer scripts in a couple of different ways. You can like add async to the script tag, right? That's, that's like a native way of doing it. But then there's some multiple Gatsby life cycles and lots of different patterns for um, adding scripts. So you can use HTML.js, you can use like on render body, um, but you can defer, you can, there's other life cycle hooks where the script will load later. Um, and they run in like Gatsby browser. So if you've ever seen the Gatsby browser file and been like, what is that? What is that for? Um, there's one called on client entry. So if you put the script in on client entry, it will execute after the page loads, but before the browser renders the page, then you can do it, defer it even later to a lifecycle hook called on initial client render to have it execute after the browser has rendered the page. So there can be a different behavior with different libraries, depending on what that library is trying to do. So you can imagine like some kind of AB testing library that has to actually change markup. You know, you might not want to do that one too late because then you have like a jumpy, a jumpy change or something. It might help performance, but they see a flash. Um, for other ones, it might be, it might need to capture core web vitals. And so it needs to be on the page super, super early um, in order to get those. Um, so a, a couple of different ways of just like where, where and when the script loads. Um, another thing, again, I like to do is I like to just, I want to measure, I want to know the cost, right? So make a branch with none of these third-party scripts, maybe make a branch with a couple different groups of our, this, this type of, of this family of libraries is like tracking or ads or whatever, mark out different ones and test the branches and at least you can then go to stakeholders or to your team and say, okay, here's the cost of these libraries, right? Uh, if we want ads, it's going to cost us 15 lighthouse points. Like, you know, if you, if you comment those out and you see it go up or down by 15, like you just know the cost and that can at least inform your decision and say, okay, that's worth it or not, or we need to try to optimize or whatever, but um, it can, it can prevent you from spending time working on something that may, may not have an impact um, or maybe something that, you know, it's, an absolute requirement for the business. A couple more things on this. There's some really exciting stuff coming out with uh, like web workers for loading third-party scripts. So there's a couple of scripts that I think I've started to do this on their own. I, it's either Sentry or Segment or one of those, like they're already have an option to load the script in a web worker where it's just like basically completely offloaded um, 
from from the from not from the browser but like from your page loading experience and then there's a library that just went into beta called party town um that lets you define certain scripts you know through google tag manager or facebook pixels or whatever and have those loaded in web worker so that's going to be a huge huge impact i think on across the front end world um in general of getting getting to a place where your end user is not having to pay such a cost for your business decisions in, in a sense so um but yeah in a gatsby in a gatsby site look at that uh that link i sent and some of the recommendations for how to defer certain scripts um how did gatsby inline css work with content security policies uh, i'll be honest i'm not i'm not sure um we do have there are lots of plugins for setting headers like if you want to um address address that i think it might depend on your uh your hosting i see people saying they don't that might depend on your hosting because you can set your headers um in the content security headers however you would like i'm just posted the link again um let's see is it possible to have a dsr ssr on a prim running gatsby uh not on gatsby cloud uh no whatever provider you're doing has to build that infrastructure. So like, I think Netlify, maybe, maybe Vercel also has it. Um, but no, there's not, there's not a way to, uh, there's no docs on like setting that up yourself um, at the moment. Um, let's see, does Gats, Gatsby inline critical CSS by default? Uh, like I said, I need, I need to check on that. I, oh wait, inline critical CSS. Yes, it does do that by default. I wasn't sure if it does the route splitting or not. I'll need to look at that. Um, oh, you know what? I'm sorry, y'all. I was posting. Uh, I was posting the link to just Aaron and I and and Dan who do not need that link. There we go. Just post it again. Um, how can I optimize my site? Third party scripts. Yep. So address that one. DSG only with Gatsby Cloud. Uh, I believe Gatsby Cloud, Netlify, and maybe Vercel. Not not with Firebase. Uh, can you put it both high in Cloudflare? Yeah, you can. Um, you can deploy Gatsby to Cloudflare. Totally. At the end of the day, it's it's a public. It's a directory called public with a bunch of static HTML, and CSS, JavaScript. You can deploy it wherever you want. Um, how is cache timeout set? We've got an article on like our caching philosophy. Um, Gatsby sites are typically driven by data, right? So. When the data is invalidated, then or when the data is updated, then then lots of cache gets invalidated. Um, let's see. I can share. It. Can yeah, Dan, check. if you want to find, if you want to yeah, find yeah, like yeah. one of our, what are, we do set some default cache values, but again, there's lots of uh, lots of options with whoever your hosting provider is for setting your own caching values. Uh, any recommendation for how to improve the initial hit um, with DSG SSR? Um, yeah, I mean, DSG SSR, it's going to be, it's going to be slower than, than static. Um, that's kind of like part of why static, uh, static came to be, I do know like Gatsby cloud in particular, um, it's been a huge initiative for us. Like step one was, you know, make it work, uh, make it right, make it fast. So, uh, step one for us at the end of 2021 was, was making it work. And now, uh, SSR should be should be really fast. I don't think you should have any SSR differences between Gatsby or or any other kind of SSR um, framework or provider. Um, DSG is a little bit more complicated, and and we are working on making DSG uh, that first hit for DSG faster. faster. Yeah. yeah um, there's an SEO question about that too. How does DSG affect SEO? Um, it definitely is slower in. Um, on the, the micro, the thing though is the macro and like we talked about the field data of how it's collected. So if one user is getting that like slower hit and everyone else is getting the faster one, um, in aggregate, it still is going to be a much better um, performant way to render your pages. So your SEO is still gonna be much better than SSR um, because of that. So you can think about it like on a spectrum, it's, it is, more towards static uh, than SSR for sure. Is there a chance to invalidate the cache for a page built on CDN via Gatsby or is it dependent on C CDN? Um, invalidating a cache, uh, it's, that sounds like more of a CDN question because Gatsby itself, 
you know, it rebuilds. Well, it doesn't rebuild. It does have incremental builds. It doesn't rebuild the whole site, but the caching headers, you know, just get, just get rewritten. It doesn't actually invalidate um, any, anything's cache. Um, let's see, we use WordPress blogs and Gatsby build does not pick up the SEO field, such as metadata H2 description tags. I've not seen that issue that um, it should be able to pick up any field that's available in the, you know, the WordPress um, API. So if you're mentioning, uh, uh, if you're using WordPress, I think you might be using WP GraphQL, like you should be able to see what fields are available to the API. And if it's, if it's available in like WP GraphQL, then Gatsby should be sourcing, uh, should be sourcing all those fields. Um, why does Gatsby use dangerously set inner HTML, HTML props out body? Um, yeah, I just answered that one, but yeah. Okay. It's not yeah. so much that we choose to use it, um, but it's more of a react like convention that, that we use because we're built on react. Yeah. Yeah. Again, so if you don't know, if you ever see dangerously set inner HTML, um, the react team has said they named it that just to make you think. Um, and basically the question you need to ask yourself when you're using that is, do I control what's getting injected in here? Right. Does it come from me? Um, if it's coming from a user input, don't do it. Right. Like if it's form data, uh, then don't use dangerously set in HTML because someone could put a script tag in there. Right. But in Gatsby's case, it's, it's coming from you or, uh, you know, your, your CMS. So, um, it's, it's just to make you think. Um, how can I deal with five second LCP for mobile with my Gatsby site? Um, most likely there's large images. Um, I would check to see the quality of the image, the size of the image, whether the image is, uh, is above the fold. Um, that's, that's most likely what's going on. Seeing very large differences in performance on Lighthouse between mobile and desktop. Desktop shows 96 and mobile might go under 50. Could you assume the reason? Um, using MUI theme from media queries and built desktop first. I can tell you that that pattern is just incredibly common um, across like so many sites that I see. Uh, I, will, I will also say, this is where you need to start looking at crux data, right? Because the mobile criteria, it's very strict, right? Like it's, they're not using an iPhone, you know, an iPhone 12 on LTE, right? They're using like a Moto G4 on 3G, right? So this is, the mobile is, it's being hard on yourself, um, which is okay, right? Like you would love for anyone on that device to be having a great experience, but keep that in mind and compare it with your crux report. Be like, well, what do my, what do my mobile users typically look like? Um, are they the same as what shows up on the lighthouse report? Um, and if they are, then yeah, it's something to work on. It often, um, that's where you may want to look at, at lazy loading stuff. Uh, identifying critical paths is one thing we like to talk about of saying like, what, what are the most important paths your user could take and, and how could that mobile users, um, like how could the architecture for the page just be totally different for mobile users, right? Um, but yeah, that's where I start to look at what are my, who are my actual users um, before I spend too much time on, on the mobile performance. Um, do you have any suggestion on which approach I should take for more app-like solutions, like generating some report based on some actions? Um, no, at the end of the day, Gatsby is just, it's just React. So, um, Anything you can do in React, you can do in Gatsby. So we have lots of people that have built amazing sites with like a logged in experience um, where they log in and then it's like a dashboard or, or an app or, or what have you. So, but once you're in there, you're, you're just building React. So Gatsby shouldn't limit you um, in any ways. When you're pulling images from a CMS like Prismic, are there any tips you could recommend for better performance? Yeah, use, use Gatsby image. Um, size the images correctly or as accurately as possible when you upload them to the CMS, that'll help with build performance. So if you're doing like a small tile, um, don't do, you know, a, a small tile that you know will never be more than like 300 pixels. Don't upload a 2000 pixel wide image to the CMS. Like it'll take the build longer to resize that, that image down. Like it'll take more memory when, when sharp is processing that image. Um, uh, make your image queries. So if you have your image queries where you have like a width property for your Gatsby image, like Definitely make that as, them. yeah, make that as close to the, uh, the actual component where you're using. So again, if you have a tile that's 400 pixels, when you're making your image query, 
make it 400, right? Don't make it 2000 or something because you want a really, really sharp image. It's at the end of the day gonna, gonna hurt because it's gonna put a 2000 pixel image in a 400 pixel wide div. Uh, I'm using CSS modules. The unused CSS percentage is about 70%. What technique do you suggest for decreasing the unused CSS uh, percentage? So you have these things in the browser where the browser says, oh, you're not using any of your JavaScript or any of your CSS. And you look at the report and it's like, not, you know, you're barely using any and you're like, wow, I really messed this up. But keep in mind, like the browser can't click around, right? And in some cases, it doesn't even scroll. Um, it doesn't open pop-ups. It doesn't go into different states. It doesn't hit it from all different widths, right? So um, that, that number is probably not very accurate in reality. Now, there probably is some CSS that's not being used, but uh, don't, be, uh, don't be too hard on yourself and think that you actually have 70% of your CSS being used. It's not being used in that exact state that the page is in at that exact moment. The second you do anything, that percentage goes, the percentage of unused goes down. Um, so you slide the window down, boom, that number's down to like 30% or something, right? So then you open up a pop-up, it's down to 25, right? You do all these open the modal, 20, right? So if you're using CSS modules, especially like odds are a lot of your CSS is actually being used because I love CSS modules. I think it's so... You, you end up with such small little files and you know that every rule in there is, is being used. Um, I mean, you maybe you have a, a reset.css file that's like barely being used or something. I don't know. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, yeah, there are, there's like a purge CSS, um, but I, I wouldn't be too concerned about that um, unless you're seeing it like uh, I think you, there's a way in the Chrome DevTools to like keep that open and like click around and do stuff and like actually see it change. We have a bunch of pages that are completely static. Can we disable the hydration and JSON loading on those? So there is a Gatsby plugin, um, no JavaScript, Gatsby plugin, no JavaScript or something. Uh, yeah, like big grain of salt um, because I'm not, I have not used this, but, and, you know, one of the pros and cons of a uh, uh, plugin based ecosystem is that you don't know if it's community based, like how up to date it is, but there is a plugin for, for like getting rid of, uh, getting rid of that on like completely static pages. Um, we're, if we are reporting a website that is filled with messy, terribly hacked together, bloated CSS, what is the best way to nuke and pave with Gatsby's capabilities, best practices? Again, I like CSS modules. I like style components too. Um, I like CSS modules for like big picture reasons uh, when it comes to like having a wide range of developer skills on your team. Uh, if you're onboarding somebody new that's not used to like the style component syntax, even though I love that too, I love everything being a React component when I'm using style components, but at the same time, I know I've had teammates come on, they've never seen it before and it takes them a while to get used to it, slows people down. Um, you know, it's not as portable, right? Like if you ever wanted to rewrite that page or, or copy and paste that markup somewhere else, like you are very tied to style components. Um, so CSS modules is a nice middle of the road between like the CSS and the CSS and JS, you know, battles. Um, and so if you're using CSS modules, it you literally like only write the CSS that, that you're using. Um, yeah, I'm a big four, big, big fan. Um, Strappy 4 broke my Gatsby site. Any idea when Gatsby Strappy source for Strappy V4 will be available? Yes, uh, I believe with within a few weeks, we've been talking with them. They had the big Strappy V4 release. Um, and so the Gatsby plugin was waiting for that um, and they've been working on it. Yeah, they have we, been working on it. So it should be out soon, hopefully. Yeah, so, and one thing in big picture for everyone to keep in mind, like we have uh, like, Slack mm -hmm. channels with all these major CMSs, especially the closed source ones, right? You know, Drupal and WordPress, they're open source. So there's no one person to, uh, to keep in contact with, but, you know, Contentful, Strappy, Datto, Sanity, all these things. We're in constant communication uh, with those teams, reviewing PRs, working on bugs, features, et cetera. Uh, is there a difference between Gatsby Cloud Preview Server and the one we can run our own infrastructure? Is there a strict advantage using the Cloud Preview? Yes, there's a difference. Um, and yeah, I, I think there's an advantage too, but um, traditionally it was done. And if you're doing your own, you do a, um, 
uh, a develop process, basically. You're running like Gatsby develop and it's a long running process. And it'd be just like, just like if you were doing local development, except it's listening for data changes. Uh, it, works, it works pretty well. Like it's a pretty tried and true process, um, but Gatsby Cloud does an incremental build based one. So it, it runs a build. And then when it gets the webhook, it runs another build, but a super, super smart incremental build. Um, and that's where some there's like some proprietary Gatsby cloud code around that it also wraps around like the open source idea of incremental build, but basically we handle updates from different CMS as slightly differently and, and as intelligently as possible. So it's not a long running process. So you don't have some of the problems, you know, Gatsby develop is a different process from Gatsby build. So you could have slightly different behavior between those two and, and we unified it to like just the build process. So it's like always the same type environment, um, a production environment. Um, so yes, slight difference. Um, I think you misunderstood my question. I asked about lazily hydrating uh, the React components below the fold, not lazy loading. Oh, okay. Um, example, all use effects don't get executed on page load, which they would have been by default. Loadable components SSR. I use loadable components SSR and only load the component when it comes into view, the component won't be available for Google and thus have no S SEO. So uh, cool, lazy hydrating is sounds super cool. But loadable components SSR, um, it actually maintains SSR. So you, there is no layout shift because the markup is there, but it, it does hydrate as well, um, you know, eagerly, I guess, uh, but it is there for SEO. And there are no layout shifts if you're using the loadable components SSR plugin. If you're just using loadable components, then yeah, you're right. It's lazily loaded and lazily hydrated, and it's not there for SEO. Uh, this is what lazy hydrating circumvents. Um, I've not seen lazy hydration mentioned anywhere near Gatsby. I kind of stumbled upon it. Yeah, that's that's. I haven't I haven't heard of that either. But that sounds that sounds super cool. Um, at the same time we're banking a lot on react 18 and improvements to hydration coming with coming with react 18 things like server components so um i'm i'm hoping that those just come natively with the with uh, the react framework sooner rather than later um any thoughts about using scss and performance yeah scss is a great developer experience lets you reuse code a lot more um keep it a little bit slimmer um and if you're using a, a build tool like Gatsby, it shouldn't matter. Um, at the end of the day, you're gonna end up with, with just plain CSS and it, the, the fact that it was SCSS when you wrote it um, shouldn't matter. Um, that's all the questions I see in the Q&A. Um, I see a couple more coming in the chat. You took a performance hit on pagedata.json on Netlify, which seems to be blocking due to waiting on potential rehydration. Any ways to either shrink or break pagedata.json? Yes, um, page data.json is typically the result of a query for that page. So look at the query um, for that page and see if it's returning more items than you actually need. Often people will query like all blog posts and then they do blog post.slice three and they really just wanted the first three, right? So you can put a limit or a filter or, um, or whatever to just get less data with your, with your query in the first place. That being said, it's JSON, so it shouldn't be too much of a performance hit because the only reason JavaScript is a bigger performance hit than other assets that the browser loads is because it has to parse it and execute it. And with JSON, uh, you know, parsing JSON is basically the fastest thing in JavaScript these days. Um, so that shouldn't be, there's probably things above that, um, above the, the page data.json itself. Um, and it might be more like a symptom than the actual, than the actual problem. Um, any ways to mitigate large JSON files as a result of static queries that grab a lot of data? Uh, yeah, again, see if you can, see if you can look at something like lazy loading where you statically are getting the top 10 results and then have like a change the architecture where they have like a load more or, you know, load on scroll that then hits a dynamic API. Um, something like that. Um, that was from Neil. What about performance with animation? Sometimes I've experienced animations overloading the main thread and stuttering. Yep. Is there something we can have in mind for that with Gatsby or something we should handle on our own third parties? Um, they can do Gatsby Conf website. Shout out to Gatsby Conf and Paul Scanlon, who built the new Gatsby Conf website. He did an amazing job using, uh, I think he used React 3 Fiber, which is 
hands down one of my favorite libraries and family of libraries. So it's a React wrapper around 3JS. 3JS is no joke when it comes to like weight and, and performance implications. So he had a blog post about how he built that. So go check out Paul's blog post on the Gatsby Conf website. Typically, you're going to be looking at performance within those libraries themselves. Um, because again, Gatsby is just React. Like, yes, it does static markup on there, but once it hydrates and such, like it's, it's, it's more on that library itself. What do you think about the Preact plugin? Love it. Uh, it's mentioned in our bundle in the, in the link that I sent out. Um, drop your bundle by 37 kilobytes. I think it might improve hydration a little bit as well. Um, but yeah, big fan of the Preact plugin. Um, let's see. Okay, Ash is still on here. I'm about to uh, try out this WP GraphQL Yoast SEO plugin. Yeah, that awesome. yeah I'm, pro I'm probably missing some questions because I'm trying to scroll There's back, but I'm, I'm, getting, I'm, gonna, I'm getting lost. So I'm going to copy and paste all of it. Um, I'll try to like parse it into a, a document and then we'll try and share it out uh, with the, the presentation. But this was awesome, Grayson. Thank you so uh, see, much. Well, I got one more in the Q&A yeah. uh, from Holly. We have been having issues with needing to run Gatsby clean each time to change code on navigation elements. Any ideas what we may be doing wrong? Um, a couple of things. So this is not really front-end performance related, but it's definitely an idea with Gatsby I would like to get out there is if you're querying data when you create pages, make sure that the bulk of that querying is happening in the page template, not in Gatsby node. So there's, a, there's an anti-pattern we call context stuffing. And context stuffing is when you query everything you need for the page in Gatsby node, and you pass it all in through the context object of, of create page. Um, it works for the most part, but there's lots of cases where it doesn't. And essentially Gatsby tracks changes and updates and stuff much, much better through the page query. And the page query gets a hash and it knows if it's changed. So basically all you want to query in Gatsby node is uh, the slug to create the page and maybe a unique identifier or definitely a unique identifier for like making the page query work, you know, blog, blog ID, blog path, right? Those are the only things you should probably be querying in Gatsby node. So what you're describing is a problem that I see happen a lot. If someone is querying a lot of things in, uh, in Gatsby node um, at the same time, it, it could be a react like, key you know you maybe there's a list you say nav maybe there's a list of nav elements and and you need a key um on the nav elements um but my my thoughts immediately go to like the gatsby node and, and context context stuffing but um well cool well i hope to see uh all of you at gatsby conf um dan thanks for thanks for the webinar hopefully hopefully i got to your questions if not um, I'm on Twitter. If you're on Gatsby Cloud, uh, I, I do support for Gatsby Cloud, yeah, so I may support. I may have met you through there. Um, so it'd be nice if <laughs> if I respond to your support request. But if you if you got a question and it relates to a Gatsby Cloud site, I can give a lot more insight. But I'm also on on Twitter and GitHub as well. So thank you all. All right. Thanks so much. Bye, y'all. Enjoy. Have a good day.